Um, good morning to everyone from California. Good evening to those in Europe. Um, I'm delighted to be here with you today and share some insights from a recent book that I co-authored um, about humanizing education for immigrant and refugee students that had um, a lot of information about family engagement, and I'll be sharing some insights about that from the work and look forward to engaging in dialogue and discussion with all of you as well. Can you, um, is the sound okay? Everybody can hear me all right? Okay, great. So what I'm gonna to present to you today comes from over a decade of research and work that's chronicled in the recent book that I'll be sharing a bit more about for educators of newcomer, immigrant and refugee students, primarily focused on the United States, but with relevance for other contexts as well. I'll first start with some context setting and then discuss some of the specific strategies and approaches that we highlight in the book. So just to give us some context and get us all on the same page, um, when we think about the, the global context of migration, about 281 million people have migrated from their country of birth worldwide. The gross, the global average for gross primary school enrollment is 100% or over 100%, but for refugees globally, that's just 65%. So you see a quite a disparity there in terms of even primary school enrollment. When you look at the secondary school level, it becomes even more stark, where you have a global average gross secondary school enrollment of 77%, but for refugees, just 41%. When we look at the United States, where much of what I'm going to share today is based, the research, um, immigrants and refugees comprise, in the latest national census, 14.4% of the population. And in states such as California and New York, with higher numbers of immigrant and refugee populations, about 30% of each of those states' population is foreign-born. And across the country, one out of four people is an immigrant themselves or the child of immigrants. So quite a heavy newcomer um, population or a child of immigrants or refugees. And there's no national data in the United States collected on newcomers, but a, pr a proxy, which is and ink is a, isn't a real sort of proxy, but is what's used in the data we have is for English language learners, um, which is not the same as newcomers, but it's the only data we can get our hands on that just 60% of English language learners graduate high school across the country. So quite a bit of disparity there as well. It's an imprecise proxy. So as we were developing this book, we sought to create a resource that could offer educators information and best practices to serve newcomer students. No teacher, teacher training, teacher education program in the United States requires that educators take a course on working with immigrant and refugee students. Despite these large numbers and disparities, there's no requirement in that context. So we found a dearth of information that was teacher oriented, practical in nature and rooted in the research. And so as a result, we developed this book as a remedy to that gap. The book has three sections that you can see from the contents on this slide. Um, we have student and school profiles that are, are rich ethnographic vignettes of individuals and then schools that are, are serving newcomers well across different regions of the United St States. We have an overview of the dimensions of success for immigrant and refugee students. We posit a framework that we developed for caring schools, C-A-R-I-N-G, um, capital and the acronym um, each one of those letters has a different component of caring schools um, and definitely relates to family engagement as well. We provide a glossary for the resources and a companion website. And then we divide the strategies into three areas. So the first area is strategies for classroom and instructional design. And you can see some of the examples there um, of uh, curriculum related, grouping related, differentiated instruction. Um, including advisory periods in the in the school day, which can allow for more socio-emotional learning and having someone who could be a liaison to families. If you have an advisor who's tracking students across their classes and their school day. The second category is strategies for school design. So school-wide approaches that can really support um, humanizing education for immigrant and refugee youth. And you can see there um, advice related to staffing, coaching, school-wide policies, school climate, um, health and wellness, et cetera. 
And then the third area, and this is really where family engagement comes in most squarely, which is strategies for extra um, curricular programs, community and alumni partnerships. So you see there involving families in the life of the school, providing legal services and other resources to families, um, implementing internships, career preparation, and engaging alumni in schools as mentors, as role models, and to build community where the school can be an anchor and a center for an entire support for a larger a group of individuals at different stages of their arrival or um, integration into a particular society and to provide resources and ongoing support as well. So I'll be honing in on some of the examples from category three um, in this talk today. There are many ways that schools can facilitate the engagement of families on a school campus and in the community. At school, immigrants and refugee families' backgrounds and needs can be brought into the school programming through cultural nights, parent-teacher meetings, workshops for families, and parenting classes. Additionally, some schools have designated spaces for families um, or parents on campus, whether that be a room um, that can serve as a family resource center or through providing families a small plot on campus to cultivate foods grown in their countries, such as Oakland International High School in California does. The parents and guardians also regularly use the crops that they grow in the small plot of land on campus to teach the students how to cook foods from their respective cultural backgrounds through an after-school cooking club. And here you see some images of the school garden that the families cultivate. You see um, the students working together to learn from some of the parents how to cook and then serving the children. And then a mural on their campus that showcases foods from some of the, uh, I think it's 50 national backgrounds that students come from on campus. So you can see some different um, foods that represent the cultures of the students at the school as well and the parents. Most of these efforts to bring families to the school, bring them to campus. So parents and, and, and community members, family members um, in the United States right now, we have a lot of unaccompanied minors, primarily from Central America, who often live with a, a distant relative when they come to the United States. So it's not just parents, but extended family members that are guardians for these young people. Most of the efforts of family engagement ask those individuals to come to the school and with different work schedules and different um, uh, competing demands on their time, that can be difficult to expect that families come to school. So other initiatives also take educators and school staff out into the communities to meet families and parents where they are. Oftentimes these efforts are coordinated through a parent or family liaison that the school employs, um, whether through funds provided by the district or funds raised independently by the school, even public schools sometimes are able to apply for grants for these type of positions. However, even in the absence of such a staff member, educators and school leaders can develop robust and diverse strategies for family engagement. Throughout the multiple forms and dimensions of family engagement that we talk about in the book, there are several processes and strategies that have been identified that ensure meaningful participation of newcomer immigrant refugee students and their families. In the book, we adapt a figure that was developed um, by the United States Department of Education's 2016 Newcomer Toolkit, and it shows five processes and some concrete strategies that go along with them that can facilitate schools' effective outreach and engagement with newcomer families. So we took their chart and then we brought in our own examples to expand it a bit further. So I'll share that chart with you here, um, which is um, a table entitled Facilitating Effective Newcomer Family Engagement. So on the first process side in that column, you'll see collaboration. So some examples from this area are bringing newcomer families and school staff together to co-construct meaningful communication and resources for families and to collaborate in the delivery of learning and support activities for families. You may have schools that don't um, exclusively serve newcomers. In the US, we have several types of approaches for newcomers. You have integrated schools, you have newcomer academies within larger comprehensive schools, and then you also have schools that are, are specifically focused on newcomer students where the entire school has wraparound services. So in schools that even don't exclusively serve newcomers, there, the school should consider ways to ensure newcomer families are represented on parent associations and school committees. So really thinking about how that collaboration can take place. And often you need capacity development for that collaboration to take place. So that's the second process. 
to build staff capacity to challenge deficit mindsets about immigrants and refugees, to shift towards an assets-based orientation or what Tara Yoso calls a community cultural wealth model that acknowledges the strengths that immigrants and newcomer refugees bring with them. Some schools have created welcome kits in home languages with information about school, about parent guardian rights and responsibilities, about school schedules, calendars, procedures, and for families with limited literacy, the, these could be developed in audio formats, they could be developed with more pictures, um, really thinking about alternative formats to get the information to families to allow them to have an effective way to engage. The third process on this chart is an assets orientation that was also mentioned under number two, to understand the cultural orientations and perspectives towards school in students' home cultures. In many cultures, it would be disrespectful for a parent to try to question the school or engage because it would be undermining the authority of teachers. We've seen that in the literature that that can be considered disrespectful. Whereas, um, for example, in the United States, it's expected that parents, guardians, family members are engaging. And if they aren't, it's seen as, um, you know, that they don't care about their child's education, which may be very far from the truth. So drawing from their backgrounds to establish culturally congruent family engagement approaches that understand and also communicate expectations, to incorporate the cultures, histories, and realities of families into the school curriculum and activities as well is important. The next process is multimodal communications and language supports. So using multiple methods, which could be newsletters translated into languages spoken by families. This is where alumni can also help um, translate some of these materials for new families to a school, telephone trees, text threads, WhatsApp groups, websites, family liaisons. Um, especially with WhatsApp, there can be a lot of audio messages if li um, literacy levels are low. Um, just to facilitate more communication between the school and families, to ensure adequate language supports are available for all families to be able to engage. Some schools have created buddy systems for new families to pair with, um, with continuing families at the school or families of alumni from similar linguistic backgrounds to ask questions and further integrate into the school community. Um, there was a, there were examples in our research that we found of of tours that um, the buddy family would give the new families of the school and showcasing where resources are located and um, where to find information just so that it's a familiar place for families to engage when they understand where things are and and what's um, what they can access with the school as a, as a site for resources and and provision of of services. The next process is continuous improvement. So creating mechanisms in different languages for families to provide feedback, what's working for them, what's not. These could be suggestion boxes, surveys, um, short interviews on regular intervals about what could be improved, kind of that continuous learning mechanism um, that schools should engage in, not to assume that because one year this worked for families, that the following year, maybe there's new immigration flows, maybe there's new realities that families are facing, um, maybe there's an uptick of um, violence in the community or something else that requires new approaches to be developed. And to consider how family involvement may be weighed against competing demands, work schedules, and um, strive to facilitate engagement that's supportive and responsive to families. If families are expected to come at a certain time and most of the families work at that exact time, then how can, how can there be flexibility and, and continuous improvement to figure out how to meet families where they're at? So again, this was adapted from the US Department of Education's Newcomer Toolkit, um, adding in some different examples and updates um, to, their, to their processes. Immigrant and refugee family structures are often highly diverse, especially some, some children or parents migrate alone with extended periods of family separation due to a variety of reasons. Many unaccompanied minors, for example, live with an aunt, uncle, or cousin as they await the results of their asylum petitions. Effective strategies for family engagement must take into account the needs and realities of diverse families from distinct regions, realities, and backgrounds. Family spaces at school, home visits, and community walks are three approaches that I'll talk about today to facilitate family engagement that can be utilized by educators, family li liaisons, and schools serving newcomer, immigrant, and refugee populations. 
Family spaces at school could include a parent corner, a resource center, a classroom, and or as mentioned before, a family run garden. We know that space is often very limited within schools, so this approach often depends on what space is available and how active families and community partners can be in securing, maintaining, and operating that space. Regardless of the size of the space, a designated family corner or a center at school can benefit all families, and especially immigrant and refugee families who may be new to the country and its educational norms and expectations. It's an easy space for them to pinpoint that in this corner or in this resource center, I can access information or a friendly face that can help me figure out what I need to, um, to find out about. So this is an example of a parent board at a school for, for newcomer students. And you can see there, there's quite a bit of information about securing free Wi-Fi for government programs, um, information about classes for parents, meetings, um, a one-stop sort of shop for understanding what might be going on and how to, how to access it. A school calendar is there too. So parent and family centers that are well-designed carry out a number of functions. First, they welcome newcomer families by offering them a space where they can they know they can find information, and especially when they're regularly staffed by a val volunteer or a family liaison or a family engagement coordinator, they offer a sympathetic ear for problem solving. Second, family centers can be a central place of information that may be particularly relevant for newcomer families, such as how to locate food pantries, public assistance programs, internet Wi-Fi service, pro, bo pro bono legal aid, and other social services that may be harder to find out about, or one might not be sure if they're eligible for given documentation or authorization status. Even if a school doesn't have the space for a full-fledged parent or family resource center, a bulletin board such as this one can offer information for individuals to follow up with if there are questions. Third, family centers can offer information about disability services for their students. These can be often hard to know what you're entitled to, what your rights are in a new educational system. So offering information about students with disabilities or students with special needs can be something that the family bulletin boards or resource centers um, have access to in linguistically appropriate um, um, information as well for families who speak different languages. Fourth, such centers or spaces can provide resources that may not be easily accessible in homes or communities, such as shared computers. In some of the schools that we did research in, there was a, a computer room where classes for parents would take place, kind of helping them with job training, learning English. And the families could also use those shared computers to print out documents, maybe related to their legal um, petitions for asylum or for applying for public assistance. They were sort of a community hub for resources for the family who may not have computers or printers, et cetera, at home. Additionally, family centers or classrooms can be a space where community partners can, can come in to teach digital literacy or English classes or to family, to parents or guardians who might be interested and have time. And we saw this in different schools. Um, there was an example from Oakland International High School, again, the one mentioned earlier, where there's a designated family classroom where volunteers from the International Rescue Committee offer English and basic computer skills training multiple times during the week. And family members, as well as community members who may not have kids at that school can also participate in these classes that are free to attend. Schools that serve newcomer immigrants and refugees are a hub for the community to access resources and information. The more schools can embrace and facilitate this role as a community hub, the more schools can support newcomer students and their families. So the second approach that I wanna talk about today, aside from family spaces at school, are home visits. And these have been you know, controversial in the literature because for many communities, home visits have been seen as a way that families feel surveilled or um, you know, might be reported in the case of unauthorized migrants, but they can also be an extremely um, effective way to really engage families in what's going on at school and to, to facilitate communication, to bridge the gap between school and home for newcomer families. Mandy Manning, who was the 2018 National Teacher of the Year in the United States, who teaches many immigrant and refugee students in Washington State, noted that home visits, quote, um, help families know how much educators care about their children and that we are partners in helping their children achieve their potential. Students and parents learn that school is a second home for them, that they are supported, that they are welcome, and that they matter, end quote. 
Home visits must be structured in a way that is respectful and supportive of families, as there is a history, as I mentioned, of home visits being a vehicle for the expansion of deficit views, and sometimes in the history of the United States um, that have led to the removal of children of color from families for placement into institutional care. So given the sizable demographic, racial, and socioeconomic gap between many educators and the students they serve, at least here in the United States, that is the case, and in many other countries as well, some educators may feel uncomfortable visiting the family, the neighborhoods that families live in, and some families may feel uncomfortable having someone from such different backgrounds visit their homes as well. So there might be some initial skepticism. So educators can ascertain the best times of the day, what day of the week, um, when families aren't, when parents aren't working, they can work in pairs, and they can also critically self-reflect on what fears might be warranted versus those that may be rooted in assumptions or stereotypes that they hold of the communities that they serve. Receiving a home visit is ultimately the choice of the families to choose or not. And some may need a, a bit more time to build trust with the school, especially the case of those with unauthorized immigration statuses. That said, many immigrant and refugee families are very welcoming of educators who make the effort to visit their homes at a mutually convenient time that is not an imposition on their work or faith practices or other scheduled commitments. So some tips that we offer in the book for making home visits as effective as possible include the following. First, um, educators should learn about family norms and expectations for a visit to their home. And educators should observe and follow the norms of the home, such as removing shoes if that's expected, um, extended greetings, Learning some phrases in the home language or having the student or a community member who is multilingual serve as an interpreter may also help facilitate effective communication. Second, if families do not want to meet in their home, educators can also suggest other places where a meeting can take place, such as a local library, a park, a cafe, etc., to be a neutral ground where some of these um, dynamics may be avoided of, of suspicion or mistrust. Third, home visits can have an agenda, such as orienting families to school routines or addressing an issue. However, an important goal of these visits is getting to know families, establishing rapport, and opening up a two-way communication through as much listening as talking on the part of the educator. Some initial questions to help open the conversation could be, as, and this is suggested by Samway and her co-authors um, in the 2020 book, Supporting Newcomer Students, these can be questions such as, tell me about your child. What is your child like best about school? And what are schools like in your family's country of origin? Another prompt could also include, what are your hopes and dreams for your child, which establishes the educator as a partner in pursuit of these visions alongside the family members as well. Fourth, many families um, might offer food or drink to guests. And educators may also want to take a small token, such as cookies or fruit, to offer families to establish reciprocity. It's also recommended that educators keep track of what they learn and observe about students and their families through home visits and other interactions, such as what languages they speak, um, information about their faith traditions, what the parents' guardians do for work, any special interests, family stories that are shared, special skills or talents, and teachers, educators, school staff should note these observations down after the visit. It can be extremely disconcerting during a home visit for an educator or a staff member to be taking notes, especially for those who may be unauthorized immigrants or have had um, maybe um, difficult interactions with institutions, government institutions, where note taking can, can raise skepticism and suspicion. But it, tracking down this information through notes after the home visit can be a way to, to refer back and remember what was shared and what was learned through, through the exercise of visiting the, the student's home. The third strategy I'll talk about today is community walks. And I'll start by reading you an excerpt from my field notes um, from research um, with newcomer schools and programs that lasted over a decade. And this is an excerpt from my field notes from 2015. Standing on a busy intersection in an, in an industrial part of town, Juan, a senior at Oakland International High School in California and a leader of the community walk, discusses what it's like to work as a day laborer, how to get picked out from the crowd for jobs, how to avoid getting cheated, and how scary it is to operate heavy machinery. 
Juan worked as a day laborer for a year after arriving to the United States at the age of 16 before enrolling in high school and still goes to look for work at a corner where day laborers assemble on days he isn't in school or on days when making the rent is tight. One of the school staff asks if he's ever scared and Juan says, yes, but we need the money, so what can we do? Miss Janine, an English teacher who is a participant on the community walk, mentions that all the teachers are on different walks today as it is a mandatory professional development day. She says she loves these walks and that it's good for us to know what our students are going through. During a community walk, teachers and staff members visit students' communities. They are introduced to important landmarks and cultural centers. They meet with community leaders and they engage in discussion. As one staff member noted, quote, they also serve to immerse teachers in the home environments of their students and give students and family members the opportunity to serve as leaders, inverting roles such that our teachers become the students and our students and families become the teachers, end quote. This was from an interview with a staff member at Oakland International High School. Community walks also help teachers better understand family and community language practices and see students' multilingualism as an asset rather than a deficit. At Oakland International High School, seven or more simultaneous community walks take place on the same day each fall during a professional development day focused on diverse communities such as Yemeni, Afghan, Burmese, and Central American immigrants who make up the school's population. I'll show you an image here from the community walks. Students who were unaccompanied minors from Central America, for example, started the day by showing a clip of La Bestia, a uh, the dangerous train that many, many immigrants take through Mexico from Central America on their journey north. And it's they showed this clip from the movie Sin Nombre and then shared stories about their own journeys across the border, riding the train, catching food from kind strangers alongside the railroad tra tracks and watching helplessly as others fell off the train to their death during their migration journey. One of the students' mothers who runs a small scale catering business out of their home brought pupusas for the participants to have for lunch. And afterwards, participants in the community walk on Central American immigrants visited El Centro Legal, a local nonprofit that helps secure visas for unaccompanied minors from Central America. Ricardo, a pseudonym, an alum of Oakland International High School and a leader of the El Salvador walk when he was in high school, noted that, quote, because I was telling part of my life to teachers, I felt connected to them. Some of them actually cried when I shared my story. Community walks are a way to unify students and teachers and share with them the beauty of where our people come from. Also, we got to share about how important it is for us to be here in this country seeking better opportunities, end quote. Being able to share some of his story and the realities of his community and see a visible empathic response from teachers Ricardo found the experience of leading a community walk memorable even several years after graduating high school when asked to reflect back on the experience. The community walks always include lunch at a community location or a family's home with the cost paid for by the school as it's a regular professional development day scheduled and budgeted in their annual um, school calendar. And they always end back with a circle back at the school during which the staff members apart from the student leaders, can debrief their experiences and reflect on their learnings with each other. Community walks center students' lived realities in their communities and offer educators insights on how to support them as they pursue their education. Further, community walks offer a lesson in what Turvalon and Murray Garcia call cultural humility by replacing assumptions with firsthand interactions with students' communities and by inspiring the reflective practice needed by educators and social service providers when working with diverse populations. Other scholars have discussed the role of a caminata or a community walk conducted in Spanish by teacher educators for pre-service bilingual educators in parts of the United States to learn about the neighborhoods surrounding the students in which they are student teaching in. And both the community walks and these other forms that have developed caminatas and others offer teachers or student teachers who are in training an opportunity to better understand their students' realities and are ways to engage in critical place-based learning to bridge the distance between the school and the community. The benefits of a community walk for educators, students, and families, and the whole school community justify the significant preparation and planning required. 
Ahmed, also a pseudonym, who is an alum of Oakland International High School, who completed his bachelor's degree later at the University of California after graduating, was greatly impacted by the willingness of the teachers to learn about his culture. During the community walk, school staff ate food prepared by some of the parents. Um, this was the Yemeni community walk um, for students and families from Yemen. The educators visited the local mosque. They discussed the devastating war in his home country of Yemen, as well as the Islamophobia faced by students in the United States. In reflecting on the experience of leading the community walk a few years later while he was in college, Ahmed shared that this was an affirmation of his identity and increased his sense of belonging at the school. Further, for both Ahmed and Ricardo, as mentioned earlier, as well as others we spoke to during the research, the opportunity to be, to be selected to lead a walk and work with a team of five other students to prepare the day served as a meaningful leadership opportunity for them. Community walks can be a useful strategy in any type of school, whether for newcomer, immigrant and refugees or, or not. Fundamentally, they're about educators and school staff immersing themselves in the communities of the families they serve. Students in leading a community walk have the opportunity to offer their own stories and perspectives, demonstrating their expertise in being a member of their community. This reversal of customary roles can be extremely powerful for students. Schools that opt to do community walks can benefit from the greater engagement with parents, families, and community-based institutions in order to create more culturally and socio-politically aligned practices and supports for students. So in summary, through these um, lessons and strategies and approaches we discuss on family engagement, we posit that educators should consider and address issues of accessibility with regards to language and forms of communication, the times of events, the meetings vis-a-vis -vis family work schedules, and the cultural expectations regarding school family relationships. We also posit that effective ways to engage newcomer families include well-designed and well-operated family spaces at school, home visits, and community walks that are ideally held in the fall um, at the beginning of the academic year so that the information gleaned can be used to guide instruction and provide services throughout the school year. To close, I wanted to give you a link to the companion website for the book and where you can find more information about how to access it. And at this link is also a video playlist that showcases many of the strategies that I talked about today. There's a whole video on community walks where you can see how those take place. Um, as well as videos on other strategies used by the schools that we profile in the book as well. Thank you. I look forward to engaging with you through discussion. <laughs>